Hey you guys, it's Najwa. Welcome back to my channel. I'm so glad that you're here for another video. Um, I have been sick and I actually found out that it was COVID the last time I talked to you guys. I thought it was just a cold. We were traveling to Portugal and, um, you know, we were there for three days seeing family and about a day and a half into the trip, you know, my throat just was mildly hurting. And then, uh, which I thought was just, you know, a symptom of the cold. I didn't think that it was like anything very serious. And then, uh, by the time we were coming back to Paris, you saw, so on the plane, there was a woman. And she was coughing like she was literally about to <laughs> spit up her lung. And so, I was just like, dude. I got it. I got a sore throat. At this point, I thought it was just a cold, so I wasn't really, a, I, I wasn't even thinking to the point of COVID. I mean, I've been vaccinated. I've had the booster. I've already had COVID back in 2020 or 2021. We had it. Um, so it just was the last thing on my mind that I had COVID, but um, because I, I didn't have any of the, the symptoms that I had the first time, you know, the chills, shakes, the fever, um, the, the big, big boisterous coughs. I mean, I, like when my husband and I f first had COVID, like this house was just like the cough house, you know? <laughs> so, um, I really didn't suspect that this was COVID and now I know because I'm pretty sure I had the Omicron strain and Omicron affects more of the upper respiratory system and not the lower. But there was this woman on the plane and she was like about to cough a lung up. And in Paris, basically, well, really in the EU right now, the, the standard, you know, for most places, I think, for flying is that it's recommended for you to wear a mask, but you don't have to. Um, for this woman, I'm like, dude, you're, you're coughing up a lung. Like, it, it's probably best if you wear a mask. But it would probably would have been better if I wore one too because now I, I don't know where I got it from. I don't know when I got it. But all I know is when we got back to Paris, like, you know, we crashed that night. We got in like 11 o'clock. We took an Uber from the airport. We literally crawled into bed and passed out. I don't even think we ate dinner that night. I, th I think we the dinner we had was candy on the plane. So we literally just crashed out. And then, um... <laughs> Like, the next day, I, I felt like I had been hit by a friggin' bus. I mean, my throat just felt like it was about to fall off. And literally, now I'm able to speak and it's okay, so I'm pretty sure I'm over the hump. Uh, I'm gonna do another few rounds of tests, you know, before I um, unquarantine myself. But, um, yeah, I just was like, ah, dude, Omicron, like, mm, you different. <laughs> Because, I mean, I don't, I don't know, you guys comment below if anybody has had any experience with that, but I really felt like it really was more central and localized to my throat. But anyway, now I'm feeling better. Um, you guys don't even have to worry one bit. Don't worry about little Najwa. Um, I wanted to get on here today and talk about a few things, a few things that I need to update you guys on. Um, you are here on my channel this is where we talk about love, inspiration, culture, motivation. Honey, we are growing together. This is my journey, my journey as Najwa, you know, my crazy, wacky life. And I'm so glad that you guys are on this journey with me. Let's learn and love and live together a long time to kind of process this trauma um, and even really speak about it because it just hit me in a way, like I think it hit a lot of people. I want to talk about Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie. Um, I know that this is in the past, you know, it's, it's, it's been a little while since a lot of the coverage on this has actually happened and a lot of people um, have kind of moved on, moved on or resolved themselves to sort of make peace. I don't even know if you can, is that, if that's the right expression to say, if you can make peace with a situation so heinous um, but I really felt like um, I needed to get on here and speak towards this this phenomenon that's happening in culture where a lot of people 
battered people, especially women, especially battered women, will stay in relationships um, despite there being red flags, despite there being violence, um, despite the person maybe has, you know, showing these red flags of some, some very serious personality disorders, um, and they kind of just keep on ahead. And I think there's also something to speak of in society where we don't necessarily question as much as we should. We question about all the wrong things, you know? Like, we talk about in the Harry and Meghan videos how people are vilifying these two humanitarians. You know, these people are questioning the wrong things. The police officers who interviewed Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito and still let this couple drive off, those are the people who, who really aren't delving as deep as they need to be delving. Um, it just broke my heart, guys. It broke my heart for this woman. Um, I went and looked at her YouTube channel and I saw her video. I saw the video that she edited and that um, she had done the cinematography for. Uh, I, I assume that she collaborated with Brian on that, of course. And I feel deep, deep, deep sadness because clearly this girl had some raw, amazing talent. And if she were still alive today, I think that she would have been doing some very exciting things. Um, and this person took that, he took that opportunity away from her. Um, I don't think that this necessarily, um, speaks only to American society. I think that you can find domestic violence in any country. You know, here where I live in France, in, in the United States, in the United Kingdom, in India, in China, you know, wherever you look, domestic violence exists. But I do feel like, um, and I'm going to take you into a story, you know, just to give you an example of how it's so normalized in America that it, it really breaks my heart in a way that I don't see here in France. <laughs> if anything, I see French women beating men's butts, you know, kicking their butts around. They're so demanding. Um... I'm sorry, I love you French women. Don't take offense to that. I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. Y'all are bad bitches. Um, but I was staying in a hostel in San Francisco when I was uh, interning there, I think, as a student. Or maybe it was later. Maybe it was later in my career when I was freelancing. Uh, but at some point, it was at some point when I was in San Francisco and um, as I've spoken about in the video about Harry's Better Up conference, um, San Francisco is a very peculiar specimen to sort of observe because you have the juxtaposition of this lavish, you know, very wealthy, um, elite class of people and class of businesses in San Francisco while you also have this huge, huge homelessness problem. Uh, you have drug problems. Um, if you go into the cities like the Tenderloin or the Mission, um, you see um, <clears throat> these people who are panhandling, who are, you know, you see random uh, crack pipes on the floor, um, on the ground. You see, um, you know, lots of, lots of unsavory behavior. And I was staying <clears throat> in a hostel in an area, um, I can't remember exactly where it was, but I want to say it was kind of on the tail end of where all of the businesses are, you know, of the, um, the wharf, the Fisherman Wharfs kind of area district and, and the mission. And, and I'm so sorry if I'm messing all of this up because it, that, I was literally like 24 years old. So that was like eight. Uh, seven years ago um, <clears throat> but I was staying in a hostel and um, it was a one bedroom it was a older vintage retro looking building kind of one of those historic buildings and I just remember hearing next door to me there was uh, a couple 
and the guy was beating the living you know what out of the person who was supposed to be his romantic partner and I'm just sitting there you know watching TV or looking at my computer and hearing that going on in the next room hearing him busting her into walls shut up bitch sit down uh you know just and and I had no idea what was going on you know so I kind of sat there for a couple of minutes and I really I, I, I blame it on my youth you know being so young being from kind of a little country town on the outskirts of Atlanta a little suburb on the outskirts of Atlanta and not really being exposed to um, these kind of characters you get when you go to the city um, even though I had lived in cities previous to that I, I hadn't had much experience with something like that and I did sort of sit there for a couple of minutes. I didn't do anything. You know, I thought maybe it would blow over. I thought it could have been the TV. I think in the very beginning, I thought it could have been the TV. But there is definitely a moment where it became very apparent. Now, this experience at this hotel, uh, eventually when the, when the authorities and everybody kind of came in, because the authorities were called to the establishment, um, the owner of the establishment or the, the person who was occupying or uh, managing the establishment at that at, at that shift had come in so I went back into my room and I thought well I won't say I, I thought no more of it but you know I, I left that into the hands of the authorities but after that you know like I said I was young I was probably like 24 at that point and so um, after that it just seemed to open my eyes to this more and more it seemed like Whatever city I was in, if I was in my home city of Atlanta, um, if I was in Paris, if I was in London, if I was in Los Angeles, if I was in Rome, I, I would see stuff that I didn't see before. I would see um, men speaking to women in a domineering and condescending way, even if they weren't bouncing them off the walls, punching them, you know, holding them over a window. Um, I saw this. And... In America, I saw it a lot more. You know, I, I, I don't want to come on here being unpatriotic because I love my country. I love where I come from. I love what was instilled in me. That, that I feel like that really, being from the United States, you know, and, and coming from a family that wasn't necessarily extremely conservative. My parents are democratic. My grandparents are probably a little bit more conservative than they are, but um, that had high expectations, I guess, you know, and, and held us to a high standard. You know, I was raised where you had to call an adult ma'am or sir, you know, so that gives you the type of impression of what kind of household I grew up in. And it wasn't abusive by any means. It was just very disciplinarian and um, it was loving. But our parents expected us to behave well. And I think coming out of a, a little bit of a sheltered environment into, and, and I don't think that I was highly, highly sheltered. I mean, I have some friends from college who just like, they were really sheltered and then they got to university and it was just like, what? party but um <clears throat> like coming out of that and going into the world um with fresh open eyes and just sort of seeing what's out there um it changes you it changes your world view and I feel like part of who I am today how I've been able to garner the success that I have as a woman of color a manager within the advertising field which is Lily White, you know, like, I feel like part of that is attributed to my background, me being American, you know, I've been able to freelance, not just in the U.S., but in Europe, and um, I'll never, ever trash my country, you know, I'm very proud to be an American, but, you know, there is some serious stuff going on with my country at the same time that really needs to be addressed, just as any other country. And in terms of gun violence, domestic violence, um, um, 
uh, an access to social security uh and sort of just a multicultural uh, uh, uh an atmosphere of multiculturalism and inclusion i just I feel like France and America are in two very different places. Although I do think that there are some some very stark similarities between my country of residence and my country of birth. But one thing that I see that is really, really dangerous and consuming the U.S. is an issue with domestic violence. Something needs to be done about it. And... Um, I just don't feel like we can talk about the situation with Gabby Petito and Brian Laundrie without talking about white privilege. So why am I talking about white privilege and Brian Laundrie? Now, right wing conservatives or just fairly people see people who are fairly sensitive about the race, the race topic. You know, I'm going to give you a trigger warning, but these are the uncomfortable conversations that we have to have, you know. It needs to be among people of all color, all socioeconomic statuses, all races. And we also need to have a discussion about mental health. So, you know, I feel that the U.S. is going through a mental health crisis, a race crisis, and they are also going through... Uh, a domestic violence crisis and I think that we can explore ways where we can improve on all three of those levels in observing the Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito case. Now how is Brian Laundrie and Gabby Petito related to race in any way? They're just two white people you know uh, I think uh, they were uh, Brian's I think they're both of their families lived in Florida and we all know about that Florida man, those those Florida man memes, you know, Florida is, <laughs> let's just say, you know, in the American South, the, the Confederacy, you know, good old Dixie is a thing. I know all the words to Sweet Home Alabama, just like anybody else from Alabama, but we can't deny that there is a history of racism and bigotry that has been embedded in the South. Um, from the civil the the the, um, the civil war to the pre civil war era to the Jim Crow laws to, to where we are today, um, and so guys, white privilege is a thing. I I really feel like I don't need to go into explaining white privilege. If you want to understand white privilege, and you're a a person who is you know a Caucasian or European descent, go and Google the YouTube videos talking about that. Uh, uh, John Stewart has a great video about dismantling white privilege. Um, and I think that is very important for people. Just as when some people come to you and they say black people can be racist. You hear a lot of people, um, celebrities these days, who are coming out to say that black people can be racist. Absolutely black people can be racist. Anybody can be racist. So let's have these conversations. These conversations need to happen in a calm and loving and empathetic, compassionate way. And then we just need to move on. You know, like it's not as simple as moving on immediately. It will move on momentarily. <laughs> and then we'll come back to it again. And then we'll move on again. And then we'll come back to it again. That's just how it is. When we're living in a post, uh, you know, colon colonized world, that's just how it is, guys. And, and you have to accept it. People of color have to accept it. And people whose ancestors were colonizers also have to accept it. Now, why am I talking about Brian Laundrie and white privilege? So, this guy was beating on her. It's very clear. You know, when the police pull them over in the desert, and you can actually go and look at the body cam footage, um, Gabby Petito is clearly distraught. She's crying like crazy. I can't imagine they smelled very good. They looked like they... They looked... 
they look like they've been through it. You know, they look like they've been through it. They, they didn't look like two people who were having a happy camping trip. They looked like two people who were going through some violence and some dysfunctional stuff. Um, and she's, she's freaking out like this and he's calm, cool, and collected. And you guys don't see anything wrong with that. You know, they question Brian Laundry in such a lackadaisical and very surfacey type level that there was no way that Gabby could have been stopped from getting back into that van with him that day because there was not enough vigilance taken by these people. And I feel like we are living in such a patriarchal society that, you know, men kind of running the show has just been accepted. And so people don't think to kind of probe a bit further. And I think, I really, really think if those police officers that day would have at least just taken them into the police station. They said here, they told Gabby here, sit in, sit in the truck, sit in the, sit in the air conditioner. Okay, you see that they haven't bathed or whatever. And they actually ordered uh, Brian, I think, to stay in a hotel that night. Go ahead and take them into the station, okay? Contact their family. You see that these are two young people you see that something is clearly very, very, very wrong. Do something. Have the courage to do something. Just like that older woman and the hotel attendant at that hostel, the hostel attendant where I was staying in San Francisco, just how they had the courage to do something. Please, have the courage to do something. Speak up, you know? And, and I feel like, the reason that white privilege comes into this, this, this situation is because you see that there was a clear camaraderie that was established between Brian Laundry and the police officer on the body cam. The police officer on the body cam wasn't paying no mind to Brian Laundry. He wasn't, he wasn't really probing to see who this guy was, what his, what his, what, what his psychopathy could be, you know, um, he, he didn't clock him, he didn't book him, he didn't take him in, he didn't contact his family. And so, um, yeah. I mean, white privilege, it, people are born into privilege, you know, and people have privilege because of circumstantial things, okay? Privilege is always going to exist. But the point is, is that White privilege needs to be really acknowledged by the people who hold it. And a little bit of it needs to be relinquished. Okay? A little bit of it needs to be given up. A little bit of it needs to be shared. Um, now, uh, speaking on domestic violence. I worked for a child advocacy agency for a while, and so I got some insights into some absolutely cringe type st statistics. <coughs> and 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 the state that I grew up in in Georgia, a lot of children are staying in homes where they themselves are experiencing domestic violence as well as their parent. You know, usually by the parent's spouse, which is usually a male. <clears throat> so we also need to talk about the male aspect of it. You know, I, I look at Brian Laundry, and I just see a guy <clears throat> who is very insecure in himself. You know, you look at him on the videos, and he's got this fake underbite smile. <laughs> yeah, hi. You know, and he's got these duck feet. Um... I look at his artwork, he was a wonderful artist, but the content of his artwork was extremely, extremely dark and, and violent. You know, you would think that his parents would have noticed something was wrong much, much earlier. Okay? So that's right there, points to the mental health crisis. Um, so we've talked about them all. We've talked about domestic violence, race, and mental health, you know. And, and again, like I said, 
this applies to many countries. This is not just America. This, this needs to be something that we raise awareness among ourselves as a beloved community, as a community of peoples all over the world with different colors, different races, different backgrounds, because there's black domestic violence abusers, there's white domestic violence abusers, Hispanic, Asian, I mean, you name it, they exist, okay? And we need to put an end to this. It's time to put an end to this. And domestic violence isn't good in any way. We know that there's women who abuse men. There's a crazy woman in the U.S. And, and I find it so ridiculous that you hear these stories in the U.S. almost every single day. You turn on the news almost every single day. Someone has been murdered. Someone has, uh, you know... <sighs> been a victim of a stalking and the stalker shot them or something. You, you hear crap like that every single day. You know, that, that speaks to a bigger issue of something needing to be done about the gun laws. But even in, in countries where the access to guns is not as easy, domestic violence is still one of the biggest problems. So what can we do about this, guys? We can talk to each other about it. We can raise awareness. We can probe a little bit deeper. And it's not just cops that have to probe a little bit deeper. It's us too. Our families, our friends, you know, the friends and the loved ones of Gabby, you know, should have said, how well do you know this person? Does he treat you right? You know, like someone you can't tell me someone didn't have an inkling and to the fact that this person had some very, very sadistic uh, um, sociopathic tendencies before all of this happened. Someone had to have a bad feeling about this guy, whether it was Gabby's mother, her, her father, anyone. If you feel something... Say something about it. Speak up about it, okay? Brian Laundrie's parents, don't even get me started on them. They, well, you know, for first of all, we know, you know, I'm not even going to say that because I was going to say we know that if, if, if he was this messed up, it's, it, it's probably got to do with his parents. But you know what? People with personality disorders, I, I, I'm going to take that back because people with per personality disorders really can be born out of thin air. You know, it, they could have the best upbringing and still have sociopathic tendencies because it's something chemical and it's not something learned. Um, but just even in the way that the parents dealt with this, the way that they didn't contact Gabby's parents, you know, when they knew that he was back home, um, even before they knew that he was back home, I didn't really see any sign of them showing that they really cared, you know. Um, Brian's sister seemed like she had completely alienated herself from her parents because she knew how bad they were. So, to me, this points to a situation like with, um, what was his name? Uh, John, Wayne's, John Wayne Gacy's dad. So John Wayne Gacy's dad was a cross-dresser, I think, but at the same time, he was extremely abusive towards John Wayne Gacy when he was a child. Uh, when, when John was in trouble, he would call him downstairs in the basement where no one could hear him, and he would basically beat the living lights out of him. Um, and of course, he grew up to be a serial killer. Now, Brian Laundrie, I don't know if his parents were abusive. I don't know. But I look at what this person did. I look at all of the heartache and death that he left in his trails. And I think this is indicative of someone who really had some stuff going on behind the scenes at home that we don't know about. So, um... Yeah, we need to probe a little bit deeper on the level as parents, on the level as 
siblings, you know, sisters and brothers on the level of the, the law enforcement, and especially, most crucially, with the law enforcement. Because if those two people had have been brought in, brought in that day, if Gabby Petito had the opportunity to call her parents or really have someone, you know, almost like when you had to go into the principal's office at school and they call your parents, it's like, nah, it's time for you to fess up. If that had happened, she, I, I really think that she might be here today. If she just, and, and, and Gabby Petito, she is also a victim of this because she didn't express what was going on possibly to herself or to her family. If she would have talked to someone, told someone, told someone what was going on, perhaps this could have been prevented. And so, you know, I just, I, I leave this video asking you all what your thoughts are. You know, did, did you reach any sense of solace with this with this case you know have you felt resolved <clears throat> I, w I will say that you know the one resolve that I have is my faith you know I think that she is with our creator now and she doesn't have to suffer anymore she's not suffering anymore and um I take solace in that what she went through and what so many other women have gone through, tons of women, tons of women of all different colors have gone through is bringing more awareness to this issue. And maybe, it just maybe that's a glimmer of hope for the future. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments. What was your resolve after all of this happened? What was your conclusion? Was there anything that changed your your um, your stance? Maybe that changed from the beginning. Let me know. I want to hear your thoughts in the comments. And I will see you guys in the next video.